Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Maureen Sertic. She's the North American Sustainability <laughs> Lead for Global Corporation. Technology back in 2010. 
didn't go straight to Whirlpool, though. I went over to Ann Arbor. Um, I worked in standard development for sustainable building materials for two years, and then met me away to Whirlpool. So I guess the long story short is that it's taken a lot of interesting turns, and I guess the best advice I would have is just take the journey. Um, if your first job or even your second job may not be your dream job, and then once you get your dream job, it might not be your dream job anymore. So just it's part of the journey of learning. Um, you learn something new in every stage of the development. Um, and now I work at Whirlpool, so I manage a lot of these same topics. I manage recycling, I manage um, sustainability reporting, I manage environmental data for the facilities, at a regional basis. I also manage a lot of other new programs uh, for Whirlpool that we're trying to start up. So a good combination of all of my background all rolled into one very uh, challenging role. So Whirlpool. Um, Whirlpool is now the largest appliance manufacturer in the world. Um, manufacturer in over 140 countries globally. We have 10 manufacturing facilities in North America. Um, we do over $21 million a year of business at this point, and we employ over 97,000 employees. So Whirlpool is pretty big. Um, our sustainability team is about 12 people um, out of those 97,000. So we're small and mighty, but we have really big goals in terms of what we want to do to change the organization. So even though we are small, um, even Whirlpool is very accepting and very innovative and in believing that technology um, is there to be simplified people's lives. So having sustainability in place really is something that um, is for Whirlpool and innovation. They've always been looking at water efficiency and energy efficiency in the products. So they've also been looking at a lot of other aspects. So starting in 1975, they developed an Office of Environmental Quality for the organization. They started uh, the development of Energy Star programs for appliances and were heavily inv invested in the programs ever since the beginning. Um, in 2003, they debuted the world's front load washing machine. Um, it's, it's important to note just because the able to get the same performance but using a lot less water and energy than some of the older top loads that came out before them. And then in 2014, we transitioned from a high global warming foam in our refrigerator to a lower global warming foam. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation, but we're looking at all aspects of the product's life cycle, all the way from the materials it's made out of, how the products are used, how they're disposed of at end of life, and everything in between. So, I bet you never realized that a refrigerator only uses the same amount of energy as a 60 watt light bulb. I mean, everyone thinks about them running all the time, but they become so efficient that they only use the same energy as a 60 watt light bulb. Washers and dryers. So washers and dryers now have a higher capacity, 20% higher capacity. You can put that many more clothes in your washer or your dryer, but they're 70% more efficient than they were in the 70s. So, you know, it's pretty impressive how far we've come, um, but we have, always have a long way to go in that regard. Whirlpool has three publicly uh, published sustainability goals. Uh, one's on full material transparency. So understanding all of the components that go into making all of the materials that go into our products. So looking at you know wire harnesses, control boards, uh, all the, the metals, the plastics that we use, all of the different components we're in the process of going to our suppliers and finding out what's in all of those different components so that we're able to make decisions about better decisions for our products. Um, we also have a goal of achieving 15% uh, reduction in energy and water intensity at our factories. So that is a goal uh, related to our 
the, no, the amount of energy and water used to make product. So it's the um, amount of energy and water used at our factories. So it's one of those important goals for business to save energy and water because you're able to then save costs in the production as well as cheap environmental impact. Um, the third goal is uh, zero landfill waste from manufacturing by 2022. So within our facilities, we have 47 globally. They are all being tasked to come up with ways to get zero waste in the landfill. So they have to come up with some pretty innovative ways of being able to go and do that. So I told you I was going to talk to you a little bit about climate change. Because I get asked the question all the time, is climate change real? Um, climate change is not a new topic. It's not something that just recently became controversial. It's been a conversation that started back in 1987. Um, during the Brundtland Convention and shortly after spurred the conversations about sustainability, about how sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. I'm sure you've heard this many, many, many times. It becomes kind of the mantra, and I have to teach it a lot at Whirlpool with people that haven't heard it before. So it is an important fact to remember um, because it's really kind of the start of having it all make sense and being able to show how you know sustainability is the balance of the environmental, the business, and the social uh, goals. So climate change, is it real? The answer, the answer is I don't know. I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I studied a lot. There's, there's opinions on both sides, whether it's real, not real, it's caused by humans, it's not caused by humans. But there's a lot of policies out there and a lot of research out there, so you can take your decision one way or the other about whether you think it's real. But there's lots of market drivers in place that um, allow businesses to get um, incentives or even um, credits for making reductions in their carbon emissions or contributions to climate change. So there's been several uh, steps within this climate change discussion as well. So we talked about 1987 being the start of the conversation about sustainability, but in 1988, uh, the UN General Assembly put out that climate change is a common concern of mankind. That was really the first time that anyone had um, stated it directly that climate change was a real issue that needed to be addressed at the global level. <coughs> so shortly after came the Montreal Protocol, I'm sure in environmental policy classes you've heard about that. There's many um, dictate, it's dictated many different changes and how we use different refrigerants, and how we uh, do different things in our facilities. It changed a lot of the way that people operate in order to reduce their impact on climate change. Um, there was an establishment of IMC, which is the International uh, Climate Change Group. Um, 1997 was the Kyoto Protocol. And then most recently, in 2016, we had the Paris Accord. Um, that was just about one year ago in Paris where they decided that they need to do additional work globally because we're not meeting the goals that we set out in the Montreal Protocol and the Kyoto Protocol. So there's more scientific research. There's also the International Panel on Climate Change has put out a report every year um, from the early 2000s until now looking at the different um, Aspects of climate change, as well as the uh, amount of climate, or amount of greenhouse gas equivalent that you would get from different activities. So, one of the ways to mitigate climate change is through cap and trade programs. Cap and trade programs can be somewhat controversial because a lot of Environmental people may not believe that it has an impact because you're still allowing pollution to happen. But overall, the concept is that 
if you have a polluter that may not be able to change their operations, you can incentivize another company that's able to change to make a reduction. So if everybody that's able to make the change is incentivized to do so, you're going to have more people that are able to make the change than those that can't. That is in theory what is how it works. So what happens is there's a cap, which is the red dotted line. That is the policy cap, where you would set a policy and you'd say no one can exceed this cap within these industries. Um, California has a market right now, and that cap applies to uh, cement manufacturers, uh, power utilities. It also applies to oil and gas refineries and any other large carbon dioxide emitters. Um, those companies are required to either reduce or to buy credits on the carbon market. And those companies that are able to reduce on the blue side are able to make money by selling those credits to the companies that can't make any reductions in their operations. So it's an incentive for companies that are able to do better to do so. And overall, you have less carbon emitted in the atmosphere. So I have a little better video to show you, much more interesting than me talking. Just a second. All waste is a byproduct of life that gets reused to create more life. For example, a farmer owns a cow that produces waste. The waste is used by plants to create more plants. The cow eats the extra plants and creates more waste. The cycle continues. But what happens if the farmer buys too many cows? Too much waste could kill the plants. The farmer can either reduce his cows or plant more plants, but he has to do something to save his farm. This is the problem humanity faces. We create CO2, or carbon dioxide. Plants use our CO2 and make more plants. We use the plant's waste, oxygen, to breathe. But as our population continues to grow, we create more and more CO2. So much that plants can't use it fast enough. To address this challenge, 184 countries have agreed to reduce the pollution over time. This is where carbon credits come in. Governments create limits on how much pollution companies can make every year by issuing them carbon credits. One carbon credit allows a company to produce one ton of pollution per year. Cleaner companies sell the carbon credits they don't use to companies that pollute too much. If a company doesn't have enough carbon credits, then they pay a big fine to the government. Over time, less credits are issued by governments, making polluting more expensive, and rewarding companies that produce less pollution, or ones that figure out ways to get rid of it. This system results in less total pollution being produced every year. But what about you? Shouldn't you be rewarded for reducing your pollution? Now you can with Kiwi. I thought they did a really good representation of quickly explaining kind of a complicated process. So has anyone ever heard about carbon credits before? Yes. Where have you seen them? I've read a book by Louis Scott. <laughs> Has anyone seen them when they've been purchasing their airline tickets? Or when they sign up to go to a conference where they're offsetting their carbon emissions? Those are the kind of credits that we're talking about. So I talked a lot about the regulated market where there's a requirement for companies to reduce. That's one way. So this is another slide that talks about the concept of the commodity being traded. Whereas businesses that voluntarily we reduce more than they require to make money or have add value to their business. And then businesses that don't have to spend more. But there's three different markets just in the United States. So there's a regulated market in California that regulated market in California also links with Quebec and with Ontario and Canada. 
Um, there's also those voluntary markets that you would use to buy to offset your airline tickets or to offset your uh, conference uh, admission or to offset your miles driven if you'd like to do that on a, a personal basis. Um, those carbon credits come from a variety of different types of uh, projects, like reducing the amount of, well, in our case, like the project we're working on is reducing the amount of carbon dioxide coming from a, a foam. Um, more times there are things like um, reducing the amount of camp stoves in Sub-Saharan Africa. I've seen lots of water projects where they're involved installing pumps um, for those voluntary carbon markets. So there's lots of different projects and types of programs that are out there for those. Um, Climate Action Reserve and then American Carbon Registry are two of those. Um, voluntary carbon markets, but there's also many others as well that operate in the United States. Um, in the northeast part of the country, there's a, there's a small closed market called Reggie. Um, it's the nine of the northeastern states. Um, they trade amongst each other uh, based on uh, carbon emissions from facilities as well as the regulations on their um, power plants. So it's mostly uh, toward power plants in general. So Whirlpool's working on a project related to carbon markets. Um, back in 2014, we changed the type of foam that we use in our refrigerators that we make in Iowa and Ohio. Um, so we have two factories in the, we have one factory in each of those locations. That change uh, from the, just one material, so it's one blowing well, agent, it's one material within the foam. Um, went from a global warming potential of 1,030 to a global warming potential of 1. Because of our total production that we have across the United States, that's the equivalent of removing 433,000 cars from the road, or the emissions of the city of Atlanta. So it's really significant. And I guess my point here is more of, you know, you can make small changes that build up to big, big changes if you have enough volume to be able to do so. Um, so my conclusions really are that, you know, climate change is still emerging even though it's been around since 1987. It's only been 30 years, so there's a lot of work that's been done, a lot of work that still needs to happen. Um, markets exist already, um, and there's more opportunities for these types of markets. Um, so that entities are encouraged to reduce their environmental impacts. And then sustainability, um, I know there's been a lot of talks about EPA going away, and sustainability is <coughs> going away, and um, don't worry. Um, sustainability is more than just kind of a policy arm of companies. And there's lots of projects and lots of ways of showing how companies can save money um, have better brand reputation um, and be able to uh, talk about their story um, and how they're achieving environmental gains um, and tell that story to their customers. So I think that there's still a lot of value and a lot of things that um, all of us can offer in terms of making those small changes and continuing to drive the conversation around sustainability. <coughs>